Welcome to the Chapter 7 review for Algebra 2. This test is over polynomial functions. So remember that you should try these problems on your own first so that you really get the practice before you take that test. Um, then, you know, once you're finished trying the problems, you can watch this recording for the work and explanation. You can also look over the answer key um, that is provided as a PDF for the answers to each problem. You won't get as much of an explanation, right, because you don't have um, me talking in the background. So. Um, most of these problems are going to be multiple choice to kind of be similar to what you'll see on the test, but we're going to go through them, uh, a lot of them, as if we don't have choices. So write the letter for the correct answer in the blank. Obviously, there's no blank. Um, so we'll just circle. Simplify 3x to the 0 power, that quantity, squared, times 2x to the 4th power. So this is going to require us to use those different properties that we have for exponents. Um, if you don't remember those properties, they are listed out in Lesson 5.1. Um, but there's different ways that you can go about doing some of these problems. When I look at that problem, I remember that, first of all, anything to the zero power is one. So x to the zero power is really just one. So instead of three times x to the zero power, it'd be three times one. And then don't forget the squared, right, to that, x, to that first parentheses, that first group, times two x to the fourth. There's nothing going on in that second group. And I'm showing a lot more work here than you probably would on your own. 3 times 1 is 3. So now we have 3 squared times 2x to the 4th power. 3 squared, remember anything squared is multiplying it times itself. It's not 3 times 2 equals 6. It's 3 times itself twice. So 3 times 3 equals 9. So we have 9 times 2x to the 4th power. And when we're multiplying 9 um, times 2x to the 4th power, remember... It's just multiplying. There's no distributive property here. There's no addition or subtraction inside. So 9 times 2 is 18. And then x to the 4th power is just x to the 4th power. So the only exponent simplifying we had to do was that x to the 0 power. Um, so that matches an answer D. All right, number 2. Simplify 3y squared z over 15y to the 5th. So there's two things that we need to simplify here. You need to simplify your coefficients, um, 3 and 15 are just coefficients, they're just dividing like normal. It's really like a fraction, like 3 over 15. And so you would reduce whatever common factor they have, and they both are divisible by 3. Right, so if we divide both of them by 3, 3 divided by 3 is 1, so we'd have 1y squared z um, over 15 divided by 3 is 5, 5y to the fifth power. So we have one y squared z over five to the five times y to the fifth power. Um, the z has nothing to simplify. The y squared and the y to the fifth they can simplify because they have the same base. So if you remember when they have the same base, we subtract their exponents. So it'd be one y to the subtract two minus five z, and then you still have five on the bottom. Right? When you're subtracting those exponents, it's the answer is what you get up top here. So we'd have 1, 2 to minus 5 would be negative 3, so y to the negative third, z over 5. And then the other thing that we need to take care of is that we have a negative exponent. And any time we have a negative exponent, it just flips places because we can't have a negative exponent in our numerator. So we're going to take y to the negative third power, and we're going to move it to the denominator. So 1z over 5y cubed. Or what I would probably do in that situation is I actually think about more canceling out. If I have one y squared, that's really like one y y z over five y to the fifth. So I'm in my mind, I'm not necessarily writing that out each time. You know, y squared is y times y and y to the fifth is y times y times y times y times y. I'm really just, you know, doing this in my head, but I have two y's on the top, which can cancel out with two of my y's on the bottom. And so then I have three y's left over. On the bottom so it's another way of looking at it um, either way you'll end up with that answer of 1 Z over 5 y cubed but we don't normally write that one of a coefficient um, so F would be our correct answer simplify 5 M minus 9 plus 4 M plus 2 um, we're just adding two polynomials here right um, there's no multiplying in between, you know, there's no dis distributive or FOIL or anything like that. If there was a subtraction, if this was a minus sign in between, then we would want to distribute that subtraction um, to both of the terms in the second parentheses. But really, we can just drop the parentheses. We can say 5 mi 5m minus 9 
plus 4m plus 2. And we can combine our like terms. 5m plus 4m would give us 9m. And negative 9 plus 2 would give us negative 7. 9m minus 7 is h. If we continue that problem, what is the degree of the polynomial of that simplified answer? So what is the degree of 9m minus 7? Right, Degree, usually with a more complicated polynomial, is um, equal to the exponent um, is equal to your largest exponent, right? And we, if you look at it, you're like, well, we don't have any exponents. Don't forget that there is still a one technically there for that m, but we just don't write it. So our degree for that polynomial is one. It's a linear binomial, right? That's another way of looking at it. Oops, that we have um, a linear polynomial. When you have degree one, it's linear. All of that, all of those vocabulary terms are also in lesson 5.1. Something else to consider with this problem is that when you look at a polynomial, you can also classify it by its number of terms. And 9m minus 7 has two terms, right? 9m would be one term and negative seven would be the other term. And since it has two terms, we would call that a binomial. So it has a degree of one, which makes it linear, but it is also a binomial, right? There um, is constant when it's a degree of zero, linear degree of one, quadratic a degree of two, and cubic a degree of three. And then you could also do binomial when it's two terms, monomial when it's one term, trinomial when it's three terms, um, or polynomials just for any number of terms. Simplify 3x times the quantity 2x squared minus y. So here we are just distributing. We're going to distribute the 3x into both of those terms because we do have subtraction inside the parentheses. So anytime you're adding or subtracting more than one term inside a parentheses, that's when you can distribute. So 3x times 2x squared, 3 times 2 is 6. x times x squared, remember we add those exponents. So we have an x to the first power times x squared, 1 plus 2 makes 3. So x cubed, 6x cubed. Um, and then 3x times negative y, we'd have a negative. 3 is your coefficient because it would just be times 1 as the coefficient of the other. And then x and y are not the same base. So we would just leave it as x, y. We normally put it in alphabetical order. So that matches answer choice C. Simplify x squared minus 2x minus 35 divided by x plus 5. So here we're dividing a polynomial by a binomial. Um, so we have two options. We can do long division or we can do synthetic division. I know in a future problem we're going to do synthetic division, so I'm going to practice long division here just so that you can see both x minus 5. Remember, long division, you put your divisor out the outside of your box to the left, and then whatever your dividend is, that goes inside the box. So x squared minus 2x minus 35. Um, if you were missing any terms, you know, say <clears throat> this was x cubed and you're missing your x squared term, make sure to put like a 0x squared. Every single term should be represented, and it should be in standard form. And then we look at our biggest terms, so x and x squared. And um, there's two ways to kind of think of it in your head. You can be like, well, what times x gives me x squared? Or if I take x squared and I divide it by x, what do I get? Both ways, that number would be, or variable in this case, would, would be x. And then, of course, I went through this whole problem um, and realized that I had x minus 5, but the problem says x plus 5, so now I have to, like, redo it. So going back to where we were, still the idea of, you know, what times x will give me x squared, and that is x, right? So we do have this up top correct. Um, now what we do is we need to see how that works out. How, you know, what's left over after I multiply times x? So I'm going to take x times my divisor out here, x plus 5, and write it underneath, right? x times x is x squared, x times 5 is 5x, and then I would subtract it from what I have above, and I'm just going to write that subtraction on each of those. So I'm going to subtract x squared, and I'm going to subtract 5x. 
When I do that subtraction, x squared cancels out. Negative 2x plus a negative 5x is negative 7x. And then I can bring down my negative 35. And now I'm looking at what times x gives me negative 7x or what's negative 7x divided by x. And that would be negative 7. So I'll write that up top there with my x. And I need to check to make sure it works. So I take negative 7 times x plus 5. And I have negative 7x. And negative 7 times 5 is negative 35. And would you have it, if I subtract both of those, subtract a negative makes a positive, subtract a negative makes a positive. If I do that math, both of those would give me zero, right? Negative 7x plus 7x, negative 35 plus 35. So my remainder here is zero, which means it goes in evenly. And my answer then would just be this x minus 7 that we have up at the top. You know, when we took x plus 5 and we divided it out, we got x minus 7 left over. So H is our answer for number six. State the maximum number of turns the graph of the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 4x plus 3 could make. State the maximum number of real zeros for f of x. Now if you remember, the maximum number of turns and the maximum number of real zeros are all based off of the degree. And if we look at this function, it has a degree of, look at the highest exponent, that would be from our first term, x squared, a degree of 2. So that tells us then um, our max number of turns, you remember that's equal to our degree minus one, or in this case, two minus one, which is equal to one. So our max number of turns, this would be equal to one. It doesn't mean it has to have one term or that it's going to have one term. Um, but that's the most it could have. It can't turn more than that. And your turns is your um, points like so, your maximum and your minimum points. Like here, that graph has two turns. It has a maximum and it has a minimum, so two turns. The most that our function could have is one turn. So one max or one min. And then the other part of that problem the maximum number of real zeros. Notice how they say real zeros. That is equal to our degree. So that's equal to 2. So our maximum number of real zeros is equal to 2. We could have two real zeros. We can have one real zero. We could maybe even have zero real zeros because you could have imaginary real zeros. All right. Number 11, state the number of real zeros for the function whose graph is shown in the right. So number, how many real zeros do we have? We have one, two, and three. We have three real zeros in that graph. And if you notice, um, none of them are multiple roots or double or triple roots. Because right? if you remember, a double root happens when your graph just like touches. It touches the x-axis and bumps and comes back down. And that's not perfect because I couldn't get it. It's hard to see exactly what I'm doing, but that would be um, a double root right here. When you bump it and you go back down, that means that that root technically appears twice. Whatever that zero is, it would be a zero twice. But for this graph that we're given, um, it hits the x-axis and it keeps moving on. Hits the x-axis, keeps moving on, keep, hits it, keeps moving on. There's no um, bumping there. For questions 12 and 13, use the graph shown. Determine the values of x between which a real zero is located. Okay, so we have two real zeros in this graph. We have one here, and that is actually right at zero, which is none of our answer choices, right? With any of those that we have listed. So this is where we actually have to use our answer choices. And then here's another one, which is really close to negative one, but not at negative one. So it's somewhere in between negative one and negative two. And so that would be answer choice G. All right, with Desmos, you can approximate that um, zero a lot more closely, um, a lot more reliably than that, right? You can actually click on the zero on your Desmos graph to get a decimal up to like three decimal places, I think. Then, on that same graph, estimate the x-coordinate at which a relative max occurs. 
So here's our relative max. Um, it's the only relative max, right? Here's a min, here's a min. So if we look at that point, again, we want to know the x-coordinate at which that max occurs, right? The maximum is actually the y value because that's the highest that y is in that little section that's relative. So what's the x-coordinate? That's what the question asks. If we go straight down, that x-coordinate would be 1. So our answer would be A, 1. And then if we continue with that problem, estimate the value of the minimum. So notice how it says the minimum, and there's nothing about relative right in that problem. So the minimum value of that graph would be right there. And so if we're estimating it, it's between, um, you know, somewhere between negative 3 and negative 4. Your y value is as low. It doesn't get all the way down to negative 4. So I'm going to say uh, that your minimum that you have in this graph is approximately maybe like negative 3 point is it quite negative 3.5? We'll just say negative 3.5. It looks like it's really close to negative 3.5. If you said like negative 3.3 or negative 3.4, that would be fine as well. Use synthetic substitution to find f of negative 2 for f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus x squared minus x plus 5. Um, and this is actually going to be a case where I tell you to not follow the directions, right? Because when you're taking the test, um, you know, if they ask you to do it a certain way, unless, you know, there's a problem like that one that was, you know, the synthetic division uh, multiple choice problem, where you have to understand the synthetic division to be able to do it. Really, you can um, do the problems using any of the methods. You can use long division. You can use synthetic division. Um, you could do synthetic substitution here, or you could just plug negative 2 into all of those variables and simplify. Or what I'm going to show you here in a second is we could use Desmos to do this problem. So we have Desmos open, and we're going to type in the function f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus x squared minus x plus 5. Now remember that you can just do those exponents if you click this little keyboard at the bottom. This is your squared, and then this is the button that you'd press to get higher exponents. And if you ever need to move around, use the left and right arrows to get in an exponent, out of an exponent, whatever it might be. And then we can see from our graph what f of negative 2 is, but we can also really nicely just type in f of negative 2, and we get 67 as our answer. So our answer for number 16 would be g, 67. Again, you can do synthetic substitution. You can use Desmos. That'd be fine for this problem. Um, or you can plug in negative 2 and, you know, work it all out. So when we evaluate that function, um, we can plug it into Desmos like you see, right? That's the fastest way that we could do it. You could also evaluate it manually, right? If you want to find f of negative 2, that really means, you know, what is f equal when x is equal to negative 2? That's what Desmos is doing. It's taking this function and it's plugging negative 2 in for all those x's. So we could do 2 times negative 2 to the fourth power minus 3 times negative 2 cubed plus negative 2 squared minus negative 2 plus 5. And when you do that simplifying, you always need to do your exponents first, right? If we do order of operations, um, parentheses would be first, but all that's in the parentheses is negative 2, right? So we would do the exponents for each of those. So if I do negative 2 to the fourth power, um, that is actually 16. It's a positive 16 because a negative times a negative times a negative times a negative four times, right, would be a positive number. And negative 2 cubed, though, that would be a negative number because it would be an odd number of times. So it would be negative 8. Um, negative 2 squared, that would be a positive 4. And then here there's no exponent, but you have that double negative that makes that a positive 4. And then you have your plus 5. So once you get that exponent done, then you can multiply. So that's the key part here. Do not multiply that 2 times the negative 2 first. You need to do the fourth power first. Otherwise, you're going to do an exponent to a bigger number than you should have done. Um, now we can take 2 times it. 2 times 16 would give us 32. Negative 3 times negative 20, or ne negative 8 would give us 24. Um, plus 4, plus 4 plus 5. And if we add all of those together, it should equal set 67, right? So this is a way for us um, to check 
right? Technically, we would use Desmos to check, um, but I get a different number. Oh no, where did I make a mistake? Let's see. <laughs> um, we have two times negative two to the fourth minus three times negative two cubed. Make sure I wrote it down right. Negative two squared minus negative two plus five. That would be a positive 16. That would be a negative eight. That would be a positive four. That would be a positive four. Hmm, let me double check. Did I type it into Desmos wrong? 2x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus x squared minus x plus 5. Man, that took me a while. I finally <laughs> realized what I did. I just did this wrong. I think I was so hung up on um, doing that exponent that I somehow did an exponent here, even though it's just a double negative, right? A double negative 2 would make that a positive 2 there, right? So it would be a positive 2 here as well. And so that's how we end up getting 67 as our final answer. So now everything matches out okay. Describe the n behavior of each function. So n behavior, remember, is as x goes to infinity or as x goes to the right, what happens to y? As x goes to negative infinity or as x goes to the left, what happens to y? And remember, y is the same thing um, as f of x. f of x, all those f of x's are the same thing as y. So you could do this two ways. Um, you could notice that this is a degree of 3, which is odd. So it's going to go in opposite directions, either one of those. And our leading coefficient is 1, which is positive, which means it's going to go like this. Or we could also get out Desmos and we could look at that actual graph. So I get out Desmos here. And I type in f of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared plus 5. We can see here that, yes, that's exactly what that graph does. So we have confirmation here that our graph, you know, is going up on the right side. It's going to keep on going up here and going down on the left side. So what happens is we go to the right we're going as this direction, so x is going towards infinity, our y is going up. So y is also going towards infinity, or f of x is also going towards infinity. So we want to make sure that as x approaches infinity, your f of x is going to infinity as well. So that cancels out answer choice D. C, we have x goes to infinity, f of x goes to, yep, we want that to be infinity, we want it to get bigger. So answer cancels out answer choice C. Uh, x goes to infinity, f of x goes to infinity. So A and B are both good. If we look at the other side, right, as x goes to negative infinity, as x gets really small over on the left, our graph is going down, right, so Y um, or f of x. is going to negative infinity. So as x goes to negative infinity, f of x goes to negative infinity. So it looks like b is going to be the correct choice because a, as x goes to negative infinity, f of x does not go to infinity. So a would be wrong. So that's our um, answer for number six. Number seven, we could go through the same idea. All right? In this case, we have um, a degree of four. So it's even, which means that both sides go up or both sides go down. And because our leading coefficient is equal to negative 1, your leading coefficient, remember, is your number in front of your highest de degree term. Um, that tells us, since it's negative, that it's actually going to be going down on both sides. But we can double check our graph with Desmos, which I already did. Right, it's right here. I plugged it into Desmos, um, and we can look at the graph that way. So yes, Desmos does confirm that we go down on both sides. As, um, as we go to the right, as x approaches really big numbers like positive infinity, our graph is going down. So y, or f of x, is going to negative infinity. So as x goes to infinity, we want f of x to go to negative infinity. Well, that doesn't work. So D is wrong. As X goes to infinity, F of X is going to negative infinity. C is okay. As X goes to infinity, we need F of X to go to negative infinity. So B doesn't work. 
but a as x goes to infinity f of x is going to negative infinity okay so then the other side right as we go to the left as x approaches negative infinity again our graph is going down so f of x or y is also approaching negative infinity so really the key thing that we want here is we want both of our f of x's to go to negative infinity which we don't have here with c we have an f of x going to positive infinity a though both cases our f of x is going to negative infinity so a would be our answer for number seven here we're supposed to simplify 6w cubed plus 5w squared minus 2w plus 1 all over 3w plus 1, which remember that's really just division. We're going to divide 3w plus 1 from that polynomial 6w cubed plus 5w squared minus 2w, which means we're going to need to do some long division. So the first thing we need to do, once we have it written out, right, everything's in standard form, that's good. There's no missing terms, right, cube, squared, first power, constant, right? If there was a missing term, we put a 0w in that case. So now we're just looking, okay, 6w cubed divided by 3w. Or what would I multiply 3w by to get 6w cubed? I would multiply by a 2, right, to go from 3 to 6. And I have 1w, but I need 3, so it would be 2w squared. So now go ahead and take that 2w squared and multiply it times the 3w plus 1 to check, right? You would get 6w cubed, and if you take 2w squared times 1, that would be 2w squared. Then you're going to subtract it, right? So I just distribute the minus, do that subtraction that way. And when we subtract it, the 6w cubes cancel out. 5w squared minus 2w squared would give us 3w squared. Okay, bring down the negative um, 2w, and then we just repeat that same process, right? We're looking at, okay, 3w to 3w squared. How do we go from here to here? We already have the 3, but we have only 1w, and we need a w squared. So I'm going to multiply by a w. So let's now do that multiplication. w times 3w would be 3w squared. Right, and w times 1 would be w. So now we've got that multiplication. We're going to go ahead and subtract those, right, distribute that subtraction. The 3w squareds cancel out. Negative 2w minus w would give us negative 3w. And again, we bring down our last term here, which would be the 1. So now to finish off this problem, again, we're looking at how many times does 3w go into negative 3w? And they're almost the same except for the negative. So we're going to multiply by a negative 1 up top. So take that negative 1 times 3w, and that's negative 3w. And take that negative 1 times 1, and that's negative 1. And then, once you have that all written down, you can subtract it off. Right, so subtract that off, that would become like a double negative. Same thing here, right? If we make that a double negative, that actually would really become um, a positive. So that's what I'm going to do instead of writing those as double negatives. Let's write those as positives. So the three W's would cancel out with each other. Um, and then the one and the one, when you add them together, would make two, right? Because negative 3w and positive 3w would cancel, but positive one and positive one would make two. So now if we look at our last piece, 3w can't go into two. So two here is actually our remainder, right? We have a remainder of two. So when we have a remainder of two, we add it on at the end and you write it over top of your original um, divisor. So that would be our 3w plus 1. So our final answer then is that 2w squared plus w minus 1 plus the remainder of 2 divided by 3w plus 1. And that is the end of the chapter 7 review. Please reach out to me if you have any questions before you take the test. Good luck!